Welcome. We're delighted to see you here this afternoon. Uh, I'm Jim Wright from the History Department, and it's a real privilege uh, for me to, uh, to introduce uh, Jake Tapper today and to welcome him back to Dartmouth. I want to thank the Dickey Center and the War and Peace Studies Program for sponsoring Jake's visit, and a special thanks uh, to Stoney Portis. Uh, Stoney worked hard uh, to arrange and to coordinate this visit. He's a student in the MALS program, organized the Graduate Veterans Association, and thank you, Stoney, for all of your hard work. Stoney knows uh, Jake Tapper well uh, because he served in Afghanistan as the commander of the Black Knight Troop at Command Outpost Keating. Many people attribute to, to Phil Graham of the Washington Post the line that he uh, played out in a speech in the early 1960s that journalism is the first rough draft of history. Certainly, the sentiment uh, is older than that, but this, this old historian acknowledges that many fine journalists do a pretty good first draft of history, and we recognize a fine journalist today. Jake Tapper, uh, for the past decade, has been in a particular field of journalism, the television reporter and television commentator where that first draft often takes on a much rougher form. In this indelible and instantaneous world, of li live world of television, there's little time for rewrite. There's little time uh, for any editor uh, to have a clarifying pen to guide somebody on what it is that they're saying. But Jake Tapper has excelled in this field. <laughs> But Jake has not lost his, his sense of narrative, of the cadence of language and the nuance of words. And of course now, in the world of television, extended by the nuance of a raised eyebrow or an incredulous frown or of the wry turn of a smile. I've enjoyed watching Jake on ABC and now on CNN. He did a masterful job covering uh, the Obama campaign in 2008 and then served as the White House correspondent for ABC Television News, uh, uh, beginning with the Obama administration. He's a good influence in a world that needs badly good reporting. He understands so well the visual world of television as only a former cartoonist could. <laughs> and he appreciates succinctness and brevity as only a former online journalist at Salon.com could appreciate these things. He's not forgotten how to tell a story in good, literate English. But he also knows, in this medium of television, that too much telling can intrude on a story that is trying to tell itself. Most importantly, he brings to his journalism the capacity of a good and a learned mind. Stories that are interesting artifacts by themselves can, with a historian's curiosity about context, and about relationships become an enduring first draft of history. And our guest today does indeed have a historian's capacity and curiosity. Jake Tapper's book, uh, The Outpost, An Untold Story of American Valor, is a remarkable tribute to those men and women who have served and who do serve in Afghanistan. With the skill of a first-rate television journalist, Jake allows the men posted at Combat Outpost Keating to tell their own story, and it is a story as compelling as any classic war story. Yet, it often bears very little resemblance to our classic concept of war. Outpost is a searing account of combat in this war where combat typically wears an unfamiliar face. Combat without clear front lines, combat in which engagement with the enemy is largely defined by the enemy, combat that is largely defensive and in which significant American advantages in firepower are often only of limited use, and combat with necessarily restrictive rules of engagement. Jake has done a tremendous amount of research on the book and has informed the research by his own understanding of the world of politics and of the history of our own time. The question that nags through this story and outpost is how did, our how did our soldiers find themselves 
in such an outpost. In many ways, outpost Keating reminds me of Marines and soldiers of the Chosan Reservoir in the early winter of 1950 during the Korean War in a valley surrounded by mountains that were filled with Chinese soldiers. Except in Korea, no one in command acknowledged that the Chinese were there and then decided this was a good place to make a stand down in a valley below them. They did make a decision, though, in Afghanistan to place Keating where it was and to send men there to defend it. Describing this isolated American command as where Jake Tapper moves from superb narrative to the perspective that the narrative cries out for. He examines the political factors, the strategic considerations, the tactical positioning that result in 53 Americans fighting in a fierce battle defending the indefensible, and the final analysis, defending a place that is politically inconsequential. Except it is not an inconsequential place to those men, especially the eight who would die there on October 3, 2009, and to their families. And it should not be inconsequential to any of us. Think of Pork Chop Hill, Hamburger Hill, the Korengal Valley, Ten days ago, Jake hosted a CNN special on Clint Romache. Romache was there on that October day and received the Medal of Honor from President Obama last week for his remarkable courage under fire. In this television account, Jake Tapper let Staff Sergeant Romache tell the story. Jake stayed out of the way, but he nudged and he moved at every step masterfully. I've known Jake Tapper for 25 years. He was a student in my U.S. history class in the spring term of 1988. He was a very good student in my history class. In fact, my wife Susan was his class dean, and she too remembers Jake Tapper fondly. I have two of his static cling comic strips from the Daily D in that spring when he used me as a faculty character in the cartoon. <laughs> He, he was surprised and very briefly speechless when I noted this to him in class. Uh, Jake is only very briefly speechless, uh, I can assure you. I guess he thought I wouldn't have followed the strip or made that connection. But I have had the pleasure of an old teacher following his career over the past 22 years and reading his exceptional first draft of history. It is a personal treat for me to introduce Jake Tapper and to welcome him back to Dartmouth. Glad to have you here, Jake. Thank you. That's so nice. Thank you so much. Good to see you. So I'm not sure, is the mic on? So it's not fair to make me follow that. <laughs> Professor Wright. Um, I, uh, there are actually uh, there are two history professors of mine here that I know of. Because uh, Professor Nelson was my, my, the, the, my instructor for my senior seminar, I believe I got A's in both your classes. I believe that's true. Um, and there are other professors. Uh, it really, it was, um, I, it was such uh, a, a pleasure to be a history student here. The professors Wright, Nelson, and um, Mary Kelly, and Lacka Morsino, and Shoemaker. There were just wonderful, uh, Leo Spitzer, wonderful professors, and um, I hope uh, that it's at least a bit evident that I was following your example when I wrote this book, trying to make sure that the sentences were clear and cogent, and the end notes and the footnotes explanatory, so if anybody wanted to check to make sure how it was exactly that I knew something that I was stating, um, the evidence was all there for a historian to analyze and accept. Um, it's a real pleasure to see you both here and, of course, to be introduced by you, Professor Wright. Um, I'd also, of course, like to thank um, the, the Dickey Center and the War and Peace Fellows, Stoney Portis, Captain, soon to be Major Stoney Portis, uh, who um, has, has been a dear friend in addition to a source and um, was so instrumental in putting this today, together today. It's wonderful to be back here. I was, I was reminiscing. Um, about when I was a senior in January uh, 1991, and I was in the reserve room uh, at Baker um, 
and the war, the first Iraq war, had just broken out, and just started. And while it might be inconceivable to some in this room that we did not have email or internet or cell phones or any way to instantaneously know that such a thing was happening, it was happening. And uh, I remember a feeling of real disconnectedness to the war. It had absolutely nothing to do with me, my existence, uh, or anyone I knew. Um, and that disconnectedness is something that I have felt for a long time, haven't necessarily thought about. Um, but then when uh, I started writing this book, it became a motivating force. Professor Wright mentioned the CNN special we did on former Staff Sergeant Clint Romache. I just wanted to play a couple, a few seconds from the very beginning of it just to give you an idea of what Combat Outpost Keating was like, especially on that horrible day, October 3rd, 2009. Um, because in this day and age, uh, there is video of wars taken b on cell phones and uh, uh, by bad guys and good guys alike. Um, all of the footage that you'll see here is from bad, all the footage you'll see here from that day is from bad guys. Uh, and as the note says, other uh, footage from U.S. forces uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, that you see from inside the campus from other attacks, not the big one. So I'm just going to play that for just a few seconds to give you an idea since we do have that. October 3rd, 2009. A storm of bullets, rockets, grenades, and mortars rained down upon a remote U.S. outpost in eastern Afghanistan, deep in a valley. The Taliban had found a perfect target, Combat Outpost Keating, one of the most vulnerable American military posts in Afghanistan. Studied by the enemy since it was set up three years before, as seen in the Taliban's own video. Time and again since the post was created in 2006, its defenses were tested by the Taliban. See the muzzle flashes? But on that October morning in 2009, the enemy staged its fiercest attack yet. The high ground and their vastly superior numbers gave the Taliban a huge advantage. Eight Americans would be killed in a battle that lasted from dawn till dusk and would come to symbolize the end of a military strategy to hold remote mountainous outposts constantly under attack. But from the blood and embers, these faces of heroism, soldiers laying down their lives for their brothers, bravery rarely matched in American military history. Okay, we can turn off. Uh... That's just a, there we go, thanks. Um, th that's, that's just how this uh, hour-long special began. And the rest, uh, you can find it online if you want, if you go to the Facebook page for the book, uh, uh, facebook.com out, um, backslash outpost book. The whole hour is there. Um, and and I, I just show that to you to give you an idea of how uh, horrifying that day was uh, for the 53 US troops who were there. Um, the, I'm not a war reporter. Uh, I did a couple weeks in the ABC News Baghdad Bureau in 2005, uh, and I've covered the wars and the politics of the wars um, throughout my career as a journalist uh, ever since they began in, in 2001. But I'm not a military reporter. There are many excellent military reporters uh, who embed with troops or who go over there frequently. Uh, my former colleague at ABC News, Martha Raddatz, uh, is, is, makes frequent trips to Afghanistan. I'm not one, so I'm an unlikely person to have written this book. It started for me uh, in October 2009 in the context um, of a war that I was covering from the North Lawn of the White House, the debates that were going on between the Pentagon and President Obama. Um, General McChrystal was pushing for a surge. He wanted more troops. Documents were leaked. The uh, election in Afghanistan. Uh, fraught with corruption, had just taken place. So it was a part of my beat, but it was not a topic that I was 
familiar with in the way I, I would come to be familiar with it. My son Jack was born on October 2nd, 2009. In the haze of the hospital uh, recovery room with my wife and my daughter, I caught a news report in the small television there at Sibley Memorial Hospital in DC and saw something like that, a much more cursory explanation of what had happened at Combat Outpost Keating, but an explanation nonetheless. Up to 400 Taliban, all of whom had the high ground, facing off against just over 50 US troops in a, an outpost at the bottom of a valley, at the bottom of three steep mountains, just 14 miles from the Pakistan border. And I can't explain the moment. And um, those people who are, who are my age or older might have, might have a, a, a greater understanding of this than I would have at age 18, 19, 20. But when moments that change your life happen, you rarely realize it at the time. It's in retrospect that you realize, that's the moment I fell out of love with her. Or, oh, that really turned me off of that career. Or, this became a topic that just so fascinated me, it would, it would change my life. There was something about the moment of holding my son and hearing about eight other sons taken from this earth. A moment that made me realize how disconnected I was from these wars being fought by officials whom we all elected and sent them into battle. Whether a Democratic Congress or a Republican Congress, President Bush or President Obama. It was a moment that I realized there was so much about this war that I had been covering that I did not know. I did not know who these eight men were. I did not know what it was like to be in an attack like that. I did not know why anybody would put an outpost at the bottom of three steep mountains. I'm no military strategist, but that didn't seem to make any sense. So it set me on a path of curiosity. Initially, um, I suppose I thought that somebody would write and explain this all, and I would have an understanding of what happened, and that would be the end of that. And maybe if somebody had written that article or that magazine story or, the, or done a television special about it, um, that would have happened. As it was, there had been a similar attack a year before in Wanat, in the same province, in the same part of Afghanistan. Nine U.S. troops had been killed. And so a lot of U.S. troop, a lot of U.S. media had already told that story about Wanat, which was different in many key ways, but the idea of an overwhelming Taliban attack in which uh, almost 10 Americans were killed, that story had, had been written. And so I think because of Wanat, the story of combat outpost Keating was not told. That's a theory. I don't know it for a fact. I can tell you that when I told members of my industry, other members of the media, that I was going to write a book about this, they thought that everything had already been done about the story because David Martin, a correspondent with CBS, had done a great story and won an award for um, his story about Wanat on 60 Minutes. But the nine men who died at Wanat were not the eight men who died at Combat Outpost Keating. And Wanat was very different. Wanat was an outpost that was about to be built. Combat Outpost Keating had been there for three and a half years. In any case, it set me on this path. It set me on this journey. And no one, it's why I became a journalist, is that there were stories I wanted to read and nobody was writing them, and so I ultimately started writing freelance stories and then became full -time, a full-time journalist. Eventually, I just started making calls and trying to find out more. The Army put out their investigation of what happened in Combat Outpost Keating a few months later. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, it didn't really explain much. Uh, it reprimanded four officers, um, at least uh, three of them unfairly and then basically cast the whole issue aside because the U.S. had since left the camp. But it didn't put Combat Outpost Keating in any sort of context. It didn't explain why it was there. It didn't explain who had served there before Black Knight Troop 361 CAF. So I started making phone calls and I got in touch with some troops. Um, and eventually I got in touch with enough that I felt like I had a pitch. I'd written a couple books before, although I hadn't written any in a long time. 
and the two I'd written had been about politics, not war, um, a subject with which I was much more conversant uh, and familiar. But I, I, I successfully pitched the idea to a publisher, Little Brown and Company. They bought the pitch, and I started working on the book. Um, Captain Portis was uh, uh, the commander of Combat Outpost Keating, and he's, he's somebody whose help was invaluable. Um, but the truth is, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of troops that I spoke with uh, whose information was invaluable. And if I had written, if I had included everything that everybody remembered and detailed every single person who I spoke with, the book would have been 6,000 pages instead of 600. As I was writing the book, I got a phone call, or an email rather, from uh, a, young, a young intelligence officer named Ross Burkoff, Captain Ross Burkoff. He'd served at Combat Outpost Keating in 2006. And he insisted that I meet him for lunch. So I met him for lunch. Uh, and Ross wanted me to know why they set the outpost up, where they did. He wanted me to know the history of the outpost. He wanted me to know about the troops who died on their way to setting up the outpost, about Ben Keating, whom the camp became named after, uh, whom the camp uh, was named after, um, First Lieutenant Ben Keating from Maine. And he convinced me to, make this, to ma have the story at least include some mention of those with whom he'd served who, who either paid the ultimate price or um, still carry the scars, uh, whether they're visible or not. Then I heard from uh, a, a young guy, Lieutenant Dave Roller, who served with the squadron that was at Combat Outpost Keating the next year in 2007. He wanted me to know about the people with whom he'd served, and Captain Tom Bostic, who was his commander, who was killed there, and Private Chris Pfeiffer, who was killed there, and Staff Sergeant Ryan Fritchie, who was killed there, and he also wanted me to know, and, and his commander, Lieutenant Colonel Kalinda, wanted me to know about the successes that they'd had at Combat Outpost Keating. That whatever the camp had become in 2009, in 2007, it was different. And then guys from the squadron after that, 6-4 Cav, reached out to me. <clears throat> Pretty soon I had a much bigger book on my hands than I had originally set out to, to write. Um, I think it became a better book. It, I think it became, I hope it became a better book because it helped me understand the war in Afghanistan in a big way by looking at it in a small way, by understanding just this one small outpost uh, and what counterinsurgency is. And for those of you who don't know what counterinsurgency is, it's the military strategy that was introduced in Iraq and Afghanistan by which the US military would attempt to win over locals by connecting them to their government, uh, giving them money for economic development projects, electricity, um, education, building schools, nation building, basically. Um, and it was, a way, it was a strategy that was um, a key part of US military strategy until basically the last year or so when the strategy became train the Afghans and get the hell out, which is what it is now. Um, by looking at the counterinsurgency strategy as a whole, and not just one slice of it, but how it worked from 2006 until 2009, what worked, what didn't, enabled me to understand the war better. It made me, uh, it made me understand why it's so difficult, how it's so tough, why it's so impossible, what these Afghans are going through as they make difficult decisions, trying to decide whether or not to bond with the latest American who shows up, versus the Taliban in his midst who has killed people in the, in the village before uh, for cooperating with the Americans. And along the way, that I, as I was writing this book, I came to understand what I did not understand when I was a senior in the reserve corridor and I was completely disconnected from the first Gulf War. It made me not only understand who these people are who serve and why they serve, sometimes for noble reasons, sometimes because it is the only way out of a dead-end town or a drug problem. 
um, and maybe understand what they go through uh, as best as I can and what their families experience. And it made me realize just how disconnected I was from everything having to do with the wars that had been waged for more than a decade, even though I had reported on them, covered them, read about them, I was still somebody who didn't really understand what it is that we ask this 1 or 0.5% of the population to do for us, even if you and I, whatever misgivings we may have about this war or that war, both Iraq and Afghanistan were wars that were fought after Congress overwhelmingly voted to go to war and the president sent in troops afterwards. These were wars done with the consent of the public. These were wars waged with the American people saying, yes, we want you to fight these wars. And then the American people and the American media, after it became a bummer to cover and upsetting to watch, slowly started changing the channel or turning the page or not buying that magazine. And the stories stopped appearing as much um, on TV. And I feel that the experience has made me a better journalist, and I hope it's made me a better person. And I feel a deep gratitude to the troops who cooperated with me and trusted me to write this book and to tell their story, um, because I know that many of them were very, very skeptical of me going into it. And I don't blame them. I don't like reporters either, uh, or trust them. They get everything wrong. They have an agenda. Somehow I was able to convince Stoney and others that my agenda was to tell the story that was not being told and that I wanted to do it accurately and fairly and with an eye towards honoring those people whose names we should know. We know the names most Americans can name more Kardashians than they can name Medal of Honor recipients, even though there have been 13 of them in these two wars. Uh, we know one of them. Clint Romache, about this, who this special was about. Just a very unassuming, kind of kooky little guy from Northern California who's now a field safety specialist for an oil company in Minot, North Dakota, who is an ordinary guy who did extraordinary things. That was one of the decisions that I made when I was writing this book. I went through a few difficult decisions. One of them was, well, you learn who these people are and they're like us, they're flawed. They have messy personal lives in some cases and they're insubordinate in others and they fight with other guys. Some of them for fun were waterboarding each other. <laughs> Stoney has no comment on that. <laughs> each other, that's right, on, on each other. Not on Afghans, on each other. They wanted to see who could last the longest. I've seen the videos of Stoney. <laughs> There's no alleged about it. Zach Hoppus lasted the longest, eight seconds. Um, and, and that was a difficult decision. How, 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 how many of their flaws should I reveal? Well, you can write a book about people who go to war and they're all saints, but no one's going to believe it. Uh, and so I, I, I wrote about who these guys are. In some cases, that was distressing for people. Um, but I think for the reader, it, was, it, it made the experience more real. The other and much more difficult decision I, I faced when writing the book was how graphic to be about the violence. This was difficult because even though I had covered wars. Um, I didn't really know how bad the violence was. I mean, I knew it, but I didn't know what it meant. I knew that people lost limbs or people were burned. But my father was a, he's right here, he's a 61. Uh, he was an activist against the Vietnam War. And he was with a group called Physicians Against the Vietnam War, something like that, close enough. So he went to Vietnam during the Vietnam War to help um, kids who had been 
uh, struck by Agent Orange, impacted by Agent Orange. And he had in his closet uh, lots of photographs of these kids. And during one of many snooping sessions my brother and I were, went on in his closet, we found these pictures. And my dad saw that we found them, and he told us what they were. I saw more horrors of war that day in my dad's closet at age 10 than I have seen in any media coverage of, any American media coverage of the wars in Afghanistan or Iraq. We don't explain what's going on. We don't explain what the effect of a rocket-propelled grenade on a human body is. And look, I understand it. You don't want people to change the channel. You don't want people to turn the page. But it seems unacceptable to me that there is that level of sustained censoring uh, going on. It seems like that makes it easier for us to ask these people to do these things for us because we don't even know what they're, we're asking them to do. So I went back and forth with a number of journalist friends and troops with whom I was talking on a regular basis about how, how detailed to be about the violence. And ultimately I decided I would be pretty detailed. Not gratuitously so, and I certainly would withhold some details, but I needed to explain exactly what happens and how people die. And that was a difficult decision, but I think one that, um, and one that I know that both Stoney and my father think uh, I could have held back a little bit more, but, but one that I think was important for somebody like me to understand. So that was the experience I've had in writing the book. And it was an, it was an eye-opening experience, one that has been, um, I'm really happy that the book has been um, as successful as it's been, and I'm really happy, most importantly, that it's been received as warmly as it has been by those who serve, by uh, the men and women who have been at Combat Outpost Keating and their families, and it's become a real honor to be become a, uh, I'm not a member of the community, but to, to become somebody who is in touch and friends with this community. Um, and to help wherever I can help, uh, and to uh, make all these new friends. It's changed me, and I think, I hope, it will um, be part of uh, my new show. I'm gonna bestow you guys with a new microphone at some point, if that's okay. Get a tapper endowment. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and, and, it's, and hopefully with my new show I'll be able to, um, to talk about the war a little bit more because it's not, only, um, it's not only depressing stories, and I think this is where the American media gets so much wrong. It's not only depressing stories, and it's not, not only stories about RPGs. It's, it, it, is, it is inspiring stories. It is stories about what, what troops will do for each other and um, successes that they do have on occasion in Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, people that they have saved. Today is the sixth anniversary of the death of an Oklahoma National Guardsman whom I'm sure none of you have ever heard of unless you wrote, read my book, which uh, Buddy Huey. He's an Oklahoma National Guardsman. He went home, saw his son, who was two weeks old, went back to Afghanistan, and then on this day in 2007, was killed, he was, he was in charge of training Afghan troops and had developed a very strong bond with m many of the Afghan troops and they were ambushed and Buddy went to save one of the Afghan troops and was killed trying to do that. It's a horribly tragic story. And, his, and his, I met his son, Connor, who's now six and it, it just, it, it's very sad. But is there not something inspiring about the fact that we had a medic from Oklahoma who was willing to give his life for an Afghan soldier? Is there not something achieved? Is there not something successful about the fact that he saved Afghans while he was there? It seems to me that there are stories that we in the media could be telling and people in the public could be reading or watching that would connect us all more and more closely to this, these wars or this war now, we only have one. And, you know, we're drawing down our troops. President Obama announced 
uh, at the State of the Union a week ago that um, 34,000 of the 66,000 U.S. troops who are in Afghanistan right now will be home by this time next year. And that's great and great for them and great for their families, but there will still be more than 30,000 U.S. troops there. And even after the so-called war in Afghanistan is over in December 2014, we're still going to have troops there. Uh, we'll have special forces troops there. Uh, so the, the way that the Obama administration fudges it is by talking about how the, it'll be the end of combat missions in Afghanistan. But we'll still have troops there. We'll still have thousands of Americans in harm's way in Afghanistan. And even not including them, this war is never going to be over for a lot of people I know. Um, whether because they can't sleep at night or they're, they, they and their wives are now separated um, because they can't sleep at night or can't deal with their problems or because of scars or legs that they're missing or because they have um, horrible post-traumatic stress disorder or because they lost a son or they lost a friend. For a lot of people, this war will never be over. And so this is not a commitment that I've tried to make with an end date. This is visibly going on for a, for a bit. Um, I, sometimes I'm asked um, about President Obama and, his, and his, the fact that he doubled down and, and surged troops in Afghanistan and, and what I think about his position on the wars now. And the truth is, I think that the President Obama of 2013 would never have surged the troops like he did in 2009. I think that he feels more confident in his worldview, uh, which I think is one that's less inclined to use US military force and more inclined to try to use sanctions uh, or diplomacy or basically just let whatever's happening happen um, without risking Americans' lives. And I think you see evidence of that not only with what's going on in Syria, but also, or not going on in Syria, but also with um, his selection of John Kerry and Chuck Hagel to be the secretaries of um, state and defense, respectively. Um, two men who have five Purple Hearts between them, and Chuck Hagel, former Sergeant Hagel, has, still has shrapnel on his chest. Um, but whatever you think of them and, their, and, and their, their war service, and I'm sure we all support it and salute it, um, they are without question to the left, if I, can use a, if I can use a simplistic term, to the left of their predecessors, Leon Panetta or Bob Gates and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. I think these are two men who know what combat is and are thus less inclined to use it, even though you could make the case that both voted for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and uh, so it's, it's not a... a it doesn't hold true for every combat uh, choice before them. But I think that, that, I think that that's, that's where President Obama's um, coming from. In any case, um, that was my experience writing The Outpost, and it's been a wonderful experience going around uh, the country and, and speaking to people about the book, uh, about my experiences. Um, ben Keating's parents, um, who were, Ben is the young lieutenant uh, from Shapley, Maine, who, is the, who the camp was named after, and he's in the first part of the book. Um, some people told me that they were surprised. Well, I'll let you know that he dies, because the camp's named after him, so you'll, you'll, you'll figure that out for yourself. But, but he dies in the book, and, but it, comes as, it, has, it has come as a surprise to some readers, because I explain what he's thinking and what he's feeling. And the only reason I was able to do that is because Ben's parents, Ken and Beth, were um, especially Ken, were so eager to have the world know about Ben, that he existed, that he was their special son, that he trusted me and he shared with me letters and emails and conversations that Ben and he had had together. And for that reason, Ben, I hope, comes alive to a degree uh, in the book. And I, I, I had dealt with them only on the phone. Um, and, I, and they came to, I was at St. Anselm uh, College last night, and they came uh, last night, and I got to spend some time with them. That was really special for me. So it's been a, an incredibly eye-opening and meaningful experience for me to take on this project. Um, so uh, I, before I open the floor to questions, 
Is there anyone here who, I heard Sean, um, Shane Corville's family is from around here. Is there, are the Corvilles here at all? No, okay. I just wanted to see if there's anybody here who, who was related to anybody who had served at Combat Outpost Keating. Um, other than that, um, thank you so much. You've been a great audience. I'd love to take any, any questions you have at all. Is that Professor Pease? Are you Professor Pease? One of my great regrets is that I didn't take a class from you. <laughs> I'm serious. I had a bunch of friends who took classes with you. And Ross, yes. Anyway, yes, sir. Stoney. Sir, Stoney Forrest. <laughs> I know. I keep telling you, if you call me sir again, I'm going to throw a shoe at you. I do have a shout out to Professor Pease, because he's my faculty advisor, and no sir, I did not put him up to that. Jake, within the first couple of terms of my experience here at Dartmouth, uh, I took a class with Professor McKee, and she introduced to me uh, Edward Said's Fortean Blues. And it gave me an entire new language to articulate a potential uh, perspective that I may have unknowingly had uh, about my experiences in Iraq or in Afghanistan or anywhere. And what it gave me was uh, a, a different perspective on the interviews that you and I had, because I had that lesson well after you know, you'd already gotten the book off the ground. And so what I'm wondering is, is there a new Orientalist logic <coughs> that you have witnessed while interviewing these soldiers. And to you as an author, as well as a reporter, feel any contention between portraying their perspectives and opinions with a level of accuracy versus challenging uh, where we are as a country and our perspectives on what it means to have a homeland security state or national security concerns in the Middle East? I have to confess, I'm not hugely familiar with uh, Edward Said's views on Orientalism. Is it, is it basically just a question of, of ethnocentrism? Is that, is that the idea? Okay. Um, it was a concern when writing the book because uh, I interviewed some Afghans, uh, including two insurgents, but did not, um, the book is told from the point of view of the soldiers. I had a lot of people looking at the book. One of the big lessons um, that I learned from the last book I, I, I wrote, which was written quickly, because the recount had just happened and they wanted to get the books on the shelves in a couple months. And this one I had more time um, to really have people go through it and, and vet it and copy edit it and make sure that it was as accurate as possible. And while um, many troops were helping me with making sure that the details were right and the facts were right um, and the military jargon was understandable, I also had a couple people um, who were experts on Nuristan, the province in which this book takes place. Nuristan, for those who um, are not familiar with it but might be familiar with Rudyard Kipling, Nuristan is the province in which the man who would be king takes place. It is, uh, it has been referred to, that area has been referred to as the Afghanistan of Afghanistan, cut off from the rest of Afghanistan. The Nuristanis are their own separate and distinct ethnic group uh, not a big fan of outsiders, whether Afghans or Russians, um, Soviets, I should say. Um, the Nuristan was the last province to uh, convert to Islam, uh, which they did only at the end of the 19th century, and the first province uh, to take up arms against the Soviets. Uh, literally, there were hollowed out shells of Soviet personnel carriers outside Combat Outpost Keating, which must have been very uh, heartening to you when you saw them uh, upon your arrival. Um, but in any case, there was a State Department um, official named David Katz and uh, a, a linguist named Richard Strand, who had lived for decades in Nuristan. Um, and Strand and Katz would read drafts of the book and correct for my ethnocentrism as much as they possibly could. Uh, and that was in incredibly helpful um, because, uh, you know, the perspectives I was getting from special forces troops uh, weren't always necessarily uh, uh, ones that had been informed by Edward Said. Uh, let's, just, let's just put it that way. Uh, 
So um, that, was, uh, that was definitely uh, an issue, and I'm sure it was not uh, corrected to the satisfaction of everyone, um, but it was one that I greatly appreciated, uh, after, even though Strand is a, is a tough editor. Uh, it, it, I mean, not Strand, I'm sorry, Katz is a tough editor. Um, uh, it was uh, it was very much appreciated because of course we bring you know I bring the perspective of somebody who wants to tell the stories of the U.S. troops and you know I'm, 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 a great book could be written by you know um, you know one of the villagers in Camdash about what it was like having all these Americans come in year in year out but that just wasn't the book I was writing. Yes, sir. Um, considering how it's gone and you've been over there. What do you think it's going to look like after uh, 2014, and do you think it has been worth it being over so many years? That's a tough question. I've now been over there a couple times. I was over there once with President Obama, very briefly uh, on a Thanksgiving trip in 2010, um, and I was there again more seriously uh, just because of the work was, you know, I wasn't on the ground for just a few hours surrounded by Secret Service. It was uh, a producer and I were embedded with a medevac unit at Bagram, and then and we were also in, uh, embedded with a, a group at Ford Operating Base um, Keating. I can't really illustrate it except to say that, like, so this is this is this map that I'm very proud of. I did not do it, but the, that map I'm very proud of, which explains the area that the book takes place in. Combat Outpost Keating is here. This is as far as I got, and so then like a thumb is like five miles. So this is as far as I got, but everything here had been shut down, and I was embedded with the infantry unit there. Uh, for, uh, for some time in October, November 2011. Um, what do I think is going to happen, and is it worth it? I'm not going to answer the is it worth a question. That's not really for me to say. It's a tough one to say. If you say no, then you're talking about people having, people having given their lives uh, in vain. It's without question that um, Afghan lives uh, in many parts of the country are significantly improved, and, and you can't compare the, I mean, however much you don't like Hamid Karzai, He's a lot better than the Taliban. Uh, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen. I and mean, when I was there in 2011, um, the troops with whom I was embedded, uh, the infantry unit, uh, they thought that things were on track for the Afghan forces to be ready to take over security. But they were very, very concerned about logistics, the ability of the Afghans to take care of themselves logistically. And that's a big deal. Uh, it's not um, as understandable or as sexy as, you know, are the forces up to fighting. But whether or not you can provide uh, a medevac helicopter, whether or not you can provide ammunition and food, whether or not you can support uh, troops in the field is pivotal. And so I don't know if they're up to it logistically. Uh, I have concerns about that. Um, I mean, I suspect that once we, once the U.S. withdraws, uh, like I said, special forces troops will be there. So I, you know, I, I think um, we'll see a lot of fighting going on that, we, or we'll hear of a lot of fighting going on that we don't know about, that we can't see, that happens in the dark of night. Um, I suspect there will be some tough battles ahead for the Afghan forces, um, and I, I can't really predict. Uh, it's difficult to do so, and and and, you know, I hope I hope I'm hoping for the best. You should ask Stoney. He knows a lot more about it than I do. What do you think? I defer to you. You defer to me. Okay, <laughs> smart. That's a career officer. <laughs> yes, sir. Professor Pease. Uh, I, I thought this was a wonderful presentation. And, uh, the language is actually framed. Uh, and I would like to ask you about that. Uh, you know, you talked about the Afghan forces being Sustained by the deep connection at the level of the everyday. 
day-to-day lives of these soldiers who form the burden of the larger question are, are both questions uh, of, of value. Does the connection at the level of the personal also solicit the larger question? I think or so. Or does it sustain the disconnection at the level of the geopolitical value? I think it's, it's a great question. I, I generally, um, uh, the, the, the focus of the book, it's not, it's, it, it is, if I, have, if I have described the book in purely the personal terms, then I have done a disservice to the book, and I don't think that's what the book does. There is, um, you know, I, I'll be speaking at West Point in a, week, in, a, in, a, in a week, and I'll probably speak about the book differently. Um, uh, I, I generally, to a, a, an audience that is not consist of a full bunch of military, uh, members of the military, I tend to talk about it in my personal uh, relationship to the story and how sharing those stories has become of, of power to me um, because I think that that is what a lot of people who haven't served will get out of it, uh, is an appreciation for how difficult this work is. But it comes in the context, uh, and I think Professor Wright, as, as my former history professor would agree, it comes in a historical context of decisions being made, geopolitical decisions. I do not weigh in on whether or not we should have fought a war in Afghanistan. That's not for me to do. The book starts in 2006, not September 10th, 2001. But um, it is without question that uh, political, geopolitical, uh, strategic decisions made by President Bush and Secretary Rumsfeld, uh, that you see how their decisions end up affecting people on the ground. Uh, you see how difficult counterinsurgency as a strategy is. Uh, the man who helped set up these small outposts in Afghanistan, in eastern Afghanistan in 2006, then Colonel, now General Mick Nicholson, he says he knows it takes at least 14 years for counterinsurgency to be st st uh, successful. And yet in 2006 he's setting up these outposts. Does that mean he thinks that we're going to be there until 2020? I don't know. I doubt it. But he's doing what he can do with the number of, especially the limited resources. That's really a theme in the book that comes in time and time again. What does it mean if we don't have enough helicopters in Afghanistan? Well, it means they put an outpost next to the road because that's the only way to resupply the outpost. And if, in an eastern Afghanistan, if you're going to put an outpost next to the road, you're putting an outpost in the bottom of three steep mountains. So um, I, I would love to know what you think after you read it, if you have time. Uh, and you'll have to let me know if you think I address that enough. But I mean, I, I think it would be uh, a disservice if I only went after the tear jerking and, and not the head at all. Um, yes, you. You're waiting for the microphone. Okay. First of all, thank you for your book. I guess I had sort of an awakening moment. Uh, probably in 2010, I was at uh, Sam Houston Medical Center. Sure where a lot of uh, the vets are coming. And I was there with my nephew, who was not at Keating, uh, but was on a helicopter that went down. And I guess watching the soldiers come in as they land and they get them to Houston, and I guess the word is, if you get to Houston, you'll probably make it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but feeling totally, as you did, so disconnected that I was so unaware. I knew there was a war. I followed it because he was there. But I had no idea how horrible it was until sitting in the room with him and with other people. What, what should be expected of us, those of us who are back here waiting on them, whether we go to Sam Houston or some other place, what should we be doing to make sure that Americans are not so or sleep where this war is concerned? Because as we're sitting here and talking, they're still rolling them into Sam Houston. Yeah. First of all, how's your nephew doing? Short, missing one leg and part of another, but as active as I would never have imagined that How's he his morale? Would be. How's his spirit? Mm. Up and down. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. I went to Fort Sam Houston uh, on this book tour and got a tour of the facilities there. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Um, I wish I had the answers uh, as to what we can do to help honor our troops more and, and help the families uh, as well. I'll say that there's a general um, in the book, 
who chose not to be named, but I, I use a quote from him. You'd know his name if I told it, um, but I won't. Uh, and he, he said he was concerned about how disconnected we as a country have become from our, our um, troops. He compared it to the Romans hiring legionnaires to fight their wars. Um, and the idea that we would you know, have this other class that fights our wars and we don't really care and we're not connected to them at all. And I, I don't think that, you know, I'm not calling for, as a journalist, it would not be appropriate for me to call for a draft or an increase in taxes or a requirement for national security. I don't know. I just do feel very personally that it's unsustainable for our society to continue to function as this with this 1% bearing the burden for everybody else and the rest of us don't even know what's going on, except maybe we thank them at the airport if we see them in uniform. The, the only suggestions I could make would be if you know, I mean, you're, you are in a military family, so this isn't necessarily for you, but for those who know military families uh, or have an opportunity to hire a veteran, um, you know, do what you can to help. I mean, do what you can to help, whether, you know, it's a, a babysitting so they can have a date night because their marriage is going through a tough time or, or whatever. But, I mean, it sounds to me like you've got, you've got somebody to focus on yourself. Um, but uh, I don't know. I wish somebody in Washington would actually come up with an answer for what we can do. Uh, it felt like there was a moment after 9-11 when the country would have been willing to do anything to help the nation, whether it was national service or whatever, but we were told all we had to do was keep shopping. Um, uh, I, I do wish, that, I do wish that, that President Bush or President Obama would rise to the occasion of, of you know, uh, Michelle Obama and the first and the second lady, Dr. Jill Biden, have a program uh, for military families. Um, maybe there's something that they could do to help. So it's not just military families, but it's all of us helping military families. Um, yes, sir. I'll get to everybody. So, yes, sir. I think it's pivotal. I think the end of the draft has been pivotal to the, the certain classes being able to just, uh, not just certain classes, but to, towards the American public at large being willing to separate. We have an all-volunteer army, and uh, I think that that enables everybody to not really pay attention uh, if you're not part of that group. Well, I'm glad I could satisfy you. <laughs> there was a, yes, you. Sure. Um, okay, okay, thank you, because you're taping it. Just um, so you know, just for the record, Stoney, her calling me sir, that hurts more. Uh, <laughs> it probably hurts Stoney more just, that I'll outrank him in two weeks, too. Just so but, you know. <laughs> What'd you say? It'll probably hurt Stoney more that I'll outrank him in two weeks. Uh, we're friends. Oh, is that true? It's true. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but thank you for coming, and I think that we're all here because we agree that storytelling and education um, broadens perspective. Um, with that, you mentioned that before this experience, you were a politically driven um, journalist. Has this experience changed you into a direction where you're inspired to tell more stories, to tell military-specific stories, and where do you see your career going after this experience? Well, I, thankfully, I have I, CNN offered me my own show, and uh, so I'll be anchoring a show on CNN, and uh, one of the producers that I just hired, um, who's been at CNN for a while, said, hey, you know, CNN used to have a show called This Week in War, it was later folded into a different show and it kind of just disappeared. And I said, let's bring it back. Not as a show, but as a segment on my show. So at least every week we're doing something, whether it's a story from the home front or a story from Afghanistan or a story from Yemen or wherever we're, we're fighting our wars with our robot friends. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, that, that it's important that we keep focus on all of these stories. Um, and uh, so I, I hope, uh, and, and, and you'll, through Stoney, I hope, hold me to it, that that, that will be at least a weekly segment on my show, and, and uh, I'll try to keep a, awareness of it uh, as, much as, I, as much as I can. You know, I mean, just, just to give, it, it's, it, when I went to, uh, I started at um, CNN the day after the inauguration, and that was a Tuesday, and so the, that Friday I was in Minot, North Dakota to interview Clint Romache, and I found CNN to be an unbelievably uh, willing partner uh, in telling his story. Um, they just immediately let me go there, two cameras, producer, 
And then after the interview, and because I knew Clint, uh, I, this normally very stoic, laconic uh, uh, staff sergeant, man of few words, many deeds, um, because I'd known him for two and a half years and had proven to him of the sincerity of my desire to tell his story and the story of not just him, because that's not important to him. What's important to him is the story of his battle buddies and the eight men who didn't make it home. Um, he was unbelievably candid and emotional uh, in a way that I never expected him to be and was very, very powerful. Um, and I called Jeff Zucker, the new head of CNN, after the interview and I said, you've got, you got to give me an hour. Not even, I mean, in retrospect, that was, that's so crazy. But, but, uh, but I did, and, um, and he said, well, write a script and we'll see. And I'm sure what was going through his head is, what happens if I put on an hour about a war that the American people have already proven they don't really want to hear about? What if I put that on in prime time? What happens? Well, it turns out we actually did better than what usually airs at that time, which is a rerun of Anderson Cooper from two hours before. But people, people watched it. People watched it, and the executives were like, wow, we put on a show about war for an hour, and people watched it. So uh, my desire to do it is there. It's always going to be uh, affected by um, fears that if I put too much of it on, people will not watch the show. Uh, but uh, I, will, I will try to keep doing it. Yes, sir. Subject, uh, the word disconnect keeps coming up, which is logical. And you mentioned how you would talk to this audience. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned how you would talk to West Point. How would you talk to the uh, U.S. Congress in general and the Armed Services Committees in particular about this issue, about uh, 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 what we might have learned from, from Iraq and Afghanistan? I'd probably talk to them the same way I'm talking to people here because they're just as disconnected as anybody. Right. Well, I mean, first of all, they haven't invited me, so uh, you know it's, it's entirely hypothetical. Um, uh, although uh, I know some of them have read the book, which was very nice and flattering to hear, uh, just randomly that Marco Rubio read the book and others. And, and I think that they, I think, what comes across is how difficult the job is, and that if anything, if that's all a member of Congress or, or, or gets out of the book, that you know this isn't fun and games. These are people's lives. These are real people. And you can't just like send them into a small village at the bottom of three steep mountains and expect good things to happen overnight if you're not giving them everything they need. Um, I'll take that if that's all they get out of it. If, it, if there's just, a, just an incremental less flippancy about how quickly we talk about sending troops into anywhere, which is not to say we shouldn't use our incredibly strong military, but just that there be that much more consideration and that less... Um, that much less glibness about, about how easily we do it. Um, that would make me very happy, although I have no expectations that that will happen. Um, you. No, 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 up there, sorry. I'll get to you, you asked one. You asked one uh, just a little bit ago, okay. Um, I'm just thinking about, you said that uh, you wanted to show the violence and that there was reticence in the uh, soldiers you spoke with about the violence of the war. And I'm wondering if you collected those moments of silence to see what the soldiers were trying to shield us from. Because one of the things that strikes me is that we, um, there's a part of war that we can't talk about. And, you know, my mind is riffing on Marlon Brando in Apocalypse Now, saying the enormity of, of it. Um, but, but we don't, we, when we see those moments of silence, we're seeing wars, just, we're seeing wars violence and the effects that it has on people. And maybe we need to study that. Do you follow me on that? A bit. The, the, uh, I mean, it's, it's difficult to convey silence in the printed word. I think, I think that um, when you watch, uh, if you watch the CNN special, uh, yeah, then you see Clint struggling to speak. Um, that is incredibly powerful to me. His silence 
speaks more than his words could have as he struggles to talk about why it's important to him to recover the bodies of his friends after they've been killed, why that's so important to him, a concept that probably a lot of us, it might seem foreign to, he's gone, you know, not that you should be callous, but what's the importance of, of risking your life to recover a dead body? And in Clint's telling, his explaining, and his silence, his, 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 his the non-words, um, I think explains a lot. Um, but it's difficult to do in a book. I hear what you're saying, and uh, you know, some of the most meaningful moments I've had in the last few years are talking to troops and officers much braver than I, and as they break down and they cry and they tell me their stories, and um, it's more powerful than I could convey in a book what you know, that experience is like. Um, so all I can do is tell the stories. Um, I'll take a few more. Yes, you in the way back. Uh, thank you for coming. This um, is a great discussion. It's reminding me of when I was still on active duty, an officer of professional development, when Mark Bowden came and gave us a conversation about Black Hawk Down. He had just written it. We had some personal experiences. It actually significantly changed the way the U.S. engaged in some peace operations, and then the movie came out. What, what do you see coming from this book five years from now? Oh, God, I don't know. Um, Mark's a, that's a great book, and, and, uh, and, uh, and Mark's a, a great guy. I had the honor to meet him a few months ago. Um, I don't know. I can't say. You mean, is, is it going to be made into a movie or a documentary? Or I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, is, is that what you're... But do you see it impacting upon the counterinsurgency doctrine, if you will? And in some ways, he influenced doctrine by his book. Yeah, um, and made and brought a thoughtful discourse into the conversation on peace operations. And I'm just wondering if you think the same thing will arise. No, it's kind it's kind of presumptuous to to assume that that my book will have an effect on policy. I I don't know. I mean, I I, I know that you know people are studying combat outpost Keating uh, at Leavenworth and other places already. I don't know if they're studying cop Keating in terms of coin counterinsurgency or if they're studying it in terms of you know, where not to put an outpost, but, but uh, I think that uh, I, it's, it's tough for me to say. You know, I, I don't know how much the, those in policy are, are, I mean, I know that people, the Pentagon isn't against the book, they haven't like waged a campaign to discredit it or anything like that, but I don't know how much they're embracing it. Um, you know, the, the book is not intended to be an indictment of counterinsurgency. It's, it, it, it's, it's intended to be an illustration of just how incredibly tough it is and why it's so tough um, in real terms. In, in, in um, you know, the, counter, the new counterinsurgency manual came out into just as Cop Keating was being set up, 2006, written by our friends uh, General Petraeus and General, was it Mattis? And, and, uh, 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 yeah, and, and uh, you know, I, I think counterinsurgency, I wouldn't say that it's discredited now, but it's certainly, uh, in 2006, 2007, it's, I mean, it was trendy, counterinsurgency. It was a trendy thing in the Army. Uh, a woman from a, a female uh, lieutenant from a provincial reconstruction team was the guest of First Lady Laura Bush in either 06 or 07, sitting in the First Lady's box during State of the Union. That's how trendy it was. Um, provincial reconstruction teams are the teams sent into villages and hamlets to, to do the economic development. They were um, diplomats and army and civil engineers, um, and they were scattered throughout uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, um, or I guess not Iraq, they were called something else in Iraq. But in any case, um, I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know if anybody will make a movie. It's tough to get movies made about Iraq and Afghanistan. They don't do that well. Um, Zero Dark Thirty did well, but that's, we all know that one has a happy ending. And, uh, and uh, you know, I was told this when, when, um, when the book came out, even though it was on the bestseller list, that, you know, somebody in Hollywood told me, um, these movies don't do well. Even The Hurt Locker didn't do well. It won the Academy Award for Best Picture, but it didn't do well. So, um, let me take a few, few more. Yes, ma'am, in the way back. Sorry, I'll get to you. I'll get to everybody. And if I don't get you here, I'll get you outside. 
Yes, ma'am. You. Um, you mentioned that you decided to write the book because um, there what you couldn't find a satisfying explanation for what had happened at Outpost Keating. And so I'm wondering, in your opinion, what would the ideal media coverage of the war of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq have looked like, and what are some changes that the media can make and how they cover a war? Well, I just don't understand why we don't, I mean, we have 60-something thousand soldiers there now. I, I just don't understand how, how we can go weeks without talking about what any of them are doing. It just, just boggles the mind to me. Um, uh, so, I mean, that in my ideal but in, keep in mind, in my, in, in my ideal world, the viewers are interested in watching that, too. Um, so that's, you're asking, you know, it's, it's not, doesn't really resemble the world that we live in. Um, I mean, I guess in, in terms of the coverage of Combat Outpost Keating, I would, have, I would have had, I would have known the names of the eight men killed, and I would have known how they died. I mean, what was amazing to me when researching this book is all eight of them, every single one of them died in an act of selflessness. Every single one of them died. Um, running out into fire to save a friend, to return fire into the hills, to deliver ammunition. Every single one of them did that. And while I know their names now, um, probably very few people know their names. Uh, even people in the military probably don't know their names. And like I said, I mean, Kim, Chloe, how many Kardashians can you name? That's all I got, Kim, Kim and Chloe. <laughs> Who else? Oh, Chris Jenner, right, the mom. I'm sorry I brought it up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yes, you. You and then you both. Right. Um, so your work, you both probably think about that comparison to um, Tim Hetherington for Strepo. Um, I was curious if you ever met him, if you'd ever worked with him before Libya. No. Um, so uh, Sebastian Younger wrote the book War. And along with Tim Hetherington, um, the amazing photojournalist who was killed in Libya, uh, they did Restrepo. Um, completely, uh, I mean, similar theme, but very different. They, first of all, were very bravely embedded with those troops, I think 132, uh, in the Korangal Valley, which was in the next province over. And they were there for up to a year in and out. I'm sorry? Oh, anyway, they were, they were embedded up to a year. Uh, and so that was not my experience. I was not embedded with the troops of Cop Keating. I, you know, I mostly wrote the book in Washington, D.C. at home uh, and meeting with people in Colorado and Georgia or whatever. Um, and it's, a, it's very different. I mean, their book is much more visceral. It's about being there. It's about what it's like. And my book is uh, a broader context. Uh, I, I love Restrepo and I love war. So I'm, not, I'm certainly not, um, I mean, I, I just think they're very different. Um, I also, I think my book tells a little bit more about the backstories of some of the people in the book. So they're just, they're just different. Um, but I mean, Sebastian Younger's one of the greats, and Tim Hetherington, I mean, that was a big loss for, not just for journalism, but for the world. Yes, sir. Um, I just showed you a book yesterday, and Thanks. I very much enjoyed it. I believe I saw you at St. Anselm College. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my, my, uh, you, you made the point about um, there's a need for more resources during war. And obviously, I haven't gotten to the end of your book. But what I'm curious about in following up with people um, when they've returned to the United States, could you reflect a little bit on our current ability to supply adequate resources for people transitioning out of war and into civilian life? Well, we, I mean, the, that's a big question. I mean, um, the, the, we, we don't do enough as a society. And the government um, you know, is, is trying to do more. but, but um, struggling with it, uh, and, and uh, Professor Wright, President Wright, I'm sorry, I know you back in the day, uh, the, uh, um, could talk more about the GI Bill, uh, the new GI Bill that, that, uh, that others have tried to successfully create for troops. I mean, the biggest concern I have in terms of um, the resources here at home that we need to deploy uh, has to do with the mental health component, obviously in addition to the education and, and uh, employment problems that exist. Um, but PTSD is very real. Um, and uh, there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal uh, over the weekend about a Marine who was dealing with, um, I'm going to forget the word again, it was a moral injury is what they called it, moral injury, which was he, he had survived and he had a combination of survivor's guilt and 
it was a whole bunch of other emotional problems that were, that were separate and distinct from post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, the VA system is, um, you know, there, there are a lot of great people. My mom used to be a psychiatric nurse at the Veterans Administration Hospital, so I don't begrudge anybody. It's a lot of work for very little pay, um, but it's not adequate right now to what is going to be a mental health crisis uh, in this country. If you have two million veterans, and conservative estimates are that 20% of them, so 400,000 of them, have post-traumatic stress disorder or some related injury, not even including traumatic brain injury or others, and I think that is a way low estimate, personally. Um, you just have to ask, are, are they ready? Are we ready for that? Are we ready for that 400,000 people with post-traumatic stress disorder to be out there and dealing with what they're dealing? And that's not gonna happen in a vacuum. That's, they're gonna have families around them and friends and, you know, unfortunately some horrible things are gonna happen. Yes, ma'am. So I guess going back to the question earlier about um, improving our kind of culture of media coverage, um, it seems like with this problem of the desensitization of the average American or the disconnect of the average American with the war that- Yeah, I don't think they're desensitized. Yeah. I don't think they're sensitized. Right. Um, so if the question might be increasing media coverage, but potentially a problem is, you know, that doesn't give, if we're getting numbers and that sort of thing, um, and that's not giving us an accurate picture or kind of providing that connection. And you mentioned the possibility of these human interest stories that maybe have more of a positive aspect um, than they're getting. Do you think that that's something culture-wise that could change the way we report on war? And if so, what can we do to make that kind of the norm um, or more of the norm? I just, I just think, I mean, it doesn't have to be good news stories because obviously not all war stories are good news. And I'm not saying we need to like only do good news stories from war. I certainly don't think that. I think that we in the media and the Pentagon need to start working better uh, not cooperatively, but, but more cooperatively. I don't, I don't you know, it, it, it's healthy for there to be an arm's length between the two. But the Pentagon uh, should be more helpful about letting reporters talk to actual troops um, and, uh, and tell the truth without there being recriminations against those, those uh, soldiers or officers. And um, in doing so, they, I mean, they, they're government employees. I mean, they, 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 we should be allowed to talk to them and they should be able to tell us what's really going on. And um, that will help people connect with what's going on in a much better way than a bar graph saying 10,000 with an arrow, you know, headed towards Afghanistan. That doesn't say anything to anybody except the number. But I don't know what the public can do for it. I mean, just, I just write in if you see coverage that you like, you know, but, but I, I don't, it's, this is really a, I'm not, I don't want to absolve the public, but, but uh, this is really one that the, that the media and the Pentagon need to work on. I, we have like five more minutes, so I can take a few more questions. Yes, ma'am, right there, and then I'll do the ma'am behind you. Um, so you talked a little bit about how, at the beginning um, of starting to research the book and to write the book, more and more people uh, reached out to you with stories they had and information they wanted you to include. Um, and especially like Ben Keating's parents who were very open and very trusting um, and had a lot that they wanted to share with you. Um, and that struck me as a very big burden, maybe more so than other stories you've covered or for your other two books. Um, and so I wonder how you balanced that, having all of this trust placed in you and people handing you their stories and then charging you with, with conveying them to the rest of us, and how you, you balanced that with the needs of the, the book and the larger story you wanted to tell, and if there's anything in particular that you weren't able to fit in that you really wish you could have um, included. Well, first of all, let me respectfully disabuse you of, a, of an assumption embedded in your question, which was that this was just easy and people just handed things over to me. Uh, that is not the case, uh, I assure you. People were ultimately uh, very, very cooperative, but it took months, if not years, of trying to convince people that I was not just some slick operator in Washington looking to make a buck off of their horrible story, uh, which I'm sure was the first reaction of Stoney and anybody with a brain the first time I called them, emailed them, Facebooked them, or, or you know, introduced myself to them. I mean, there were, there were a lot of skeptics, um, not all of whom I won over, but I would say probably 98% of them I won over. Uh, and um, the truth is the story about, the first time I ever told the story about when I decided to write this book uh, and holding my son Jack the first time was 
trying to convince this one sniper who was very skeptical and d did not understand why I wanted to write this book. And f you know, after like our 10th phone call said, all right, you know, why? Like, why do you care? Like, when do, you know, and I told him the story. And, and for him, it was like, oh. And then he was cooperative. And that's the first time I told that story. And it was, it, I mean, it's a 100% true story, but I just never told it before. Um, but it took a lot of, it took a lot of work uh, to get people to trust me. Um, but it builds, it builds on itself. Um, and you're right, it is a burden. Uh, not a burden that I didn't volunteer for, um, but I, you know, responsibility is probably a better word, but it is, it is somebody putting their faith that you are going to tell their story and you're going to do so and you're going to honor their son. Um, and the truth is that not everybody's happy with the book. There are, there are people who maybe don't like certain truths having been written about their loved one or uh, themselves. Um, but I don't, you know, I didn't set out to write a book to please everybody. I set out to tell an honest story of this camp. And then you had another question at the very end. If there's anything you want to share that was, you know, was great that you could shift the world. Um, um, I forget if it was Faulkner. Professor Pease will let me know. But whoever came up with the um, killing your darlings uh, phrase about editing, about the process of taking a thousand page book and turning it into a 600 page book. Um, uh, was it Faulkner? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, see, I would have done well in your class. Uh, um, but uh, it was very painful because it's not just like, oh, I really like, you know, having a Hemingway reference here, or which, you know, they took out. Or I really like, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other, or I really like having this John Irving reference there. Maybe my, I had the wrong major. Uh, uh, things that my things that my editor took out because um, it didn't. We needed to keep going. We need the pace going, and we don't need to like. You don't need to show off that you know who John Irving is. Um, uh, and but far worse than that were the entire stories and mentions of people. Um, there are a lot of names in the book, and there used to be many more. Uh, there are a lot of stories in the book, but there used to be more, and, they, and I had to take a lot of them out because they were repetitive or they weren't really completely on point, and that was very painful. There's this whole mission that is, is um, <coughs> delayed in the book because this one soldier, this one sergeant, gets um, hit with an IED and almost loses his leg. And I tracked him down, and I found him, and I had this whole, you know, three or four pages about his ordeal, and, you know, we don't need to know all that, my editor said. They're cruel. But it made it a better book. So, yeah, there are a lot, there are a lot of stories like that. Yes, ma'am, behind. One of the things that had come out in the uh, 2012 campaign is there was the politician who ran against Tammy Duckworth. I can't remember his name, and that's probably a Just good last, thing. Yeah, Walsh. And, and I, he Walsh. was recorded at one point in disparaging his opponent and saying, oh, the, you know, the true heroes, they never talk about their service. And right. you know, as someone who is out there telling those really important stories, I was surprised that that comment didn't get as widely condemned as I felt that it should, and wondered if that was an attitude that you ran into in telling stories, and, um, and what you think can be done to combat that. And a second part of that question is you've talked a lot about building that trust and rapport in getting people to tell their stories, and I'm wondering where you got the skills to do that. What experience has helped develop those skills in you? I don't know. It's a really, I don't know why Walsh's comments didn't get more play. I feel like they got okay play. I mean, he was, it was pretty clear that his, he was not going to win, and, and, um, and uh, I feel like they were condemned. I mean, in general, it's not my position as a reporter or anchor to condemn comments. You know, I report on them, and people can make their own conclusions um, unless they're, you know, abjectly racist or false. Um, it's not my experience that heroes don't talk about their, their stories at all. I mean... I interviewed a lot of them, and they did tell their stories. Um, and a lot of them tell their stories because it feels to them like nobody knows them or cares. And, uh, and their stories often involve losing friends. So um, that's not my experience. In terms of the skills I have uh, that convince people to tell me their stories, 
That's a, that's a, I'll have to get back to you on that one. That's a really, that's a, I don't know. I, I can't really tell you. Um, I think if you're just sincere uh, as a reporter and you tell people the truth and you just say, you know, I, this is what I want to do and I really feel this way and I hope you... Persistence. Stoney says persistence. <laughs> that is the pot calling the kettle. Um, <laughs> We have time for one more question. We have one minute left. And I feel like you, you had one here. And oh, I did, but it was sort of answered. It was sort of answered already? OK, man with the orange hat. Uh, thanks for answering this question, Mr. Tapper. Um, Again, old. <laughs> Again, I'm an old man. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. But something that I think struck me, and I'm sure most other people here who didn't grow up in a military family is that sense of disconnect that you talked about. Um, and for me, as someone who is, who will soon be serving in the military, my, the first person I ever met in the military was my recruiter. Um, and I think going through this journey the last couple of years and getting to meet people, really wonderful, impressive people like Stoney and Christina and many others who have served as mentors and been really generous in giving of their time, it's made me all the more impressed and honored to someday be serving with them. Um, and I, it seems like most people who do have that kind of contact, personal contact with members of the military, really do move beyond the stereotype and get to know them as people who tend to be really impressive. And so I wonder, uh, to me, I think with the draft or national service not really being part of the political conversation, it seems like building those sort of personal connections is the only way to help bridge that divide and close that disconnect. And so I wonder, in your personal experience, did do you ever think that maybe you wish you'd served in the military or would you encourage your son to serve in the military? Wow. Um, <laughs> first of all, thank you for your service, your pending service. I haven't done anything. I know, yet, but, but, but thank you for your pending service. Um, I can't separate my son, Jack, from, I don't want him to ride a bicycle. And you're asking me if I want to send him to <laughs> Afghanistan. You know? I, you know, it, it, it's, it's, if my son wanted to go into the Army, or my daughter, uh, wanted to go into the Army or the Navy or the Air Force or the Marines um, or the Coast Guard. Uh, I would respect it, but just purely out of a desire for nothing to ever happen to them, I probably would try to talk them out of it. Um, but I would respect it. Um, in terms of, uh, I've thought a lot about, while writing this project, do, would I have served? and um, you know, I feel like, first of all, the Army would have just, like, made me a public information officer or something like that. So it's, it's not like I would have ever done, done anything like, uh, there would be no medals of honor in my future, unless they give one for, you know, turns of phrase. But, but uh, uh, I think that uh, it's still hard for me to separate myself from the disconnect. Um, and part of that also, I think, um, and this might be tougher for people uh, who are a few decades younger than me, is growing up in the shadow of the Vietnam War uh, and what that war represented um, uh, just as a, as, a, as, a, as a being, as a presence in the lives of those of us. I was born in 1969, so I remember the Vietnam War, and I remember um, war is not healthy for children and other living things posters. And I remember just the idea that war is bad. Not that soldiers are bad, but that war is bad. And it was, I was steered very much away from it. And it's just very, mu it's very difficult for me to put me, um, to, for, for me to put myself in the, in, in the shoes of a, of a troop. And it was just like I said, I was 18 years old and I was, or I was 22 years old and I was, and the Gulf War was starting and it was not even a thought in my head that I would enlist, not even a thought. But also, back then, it felt like the stakes were very different. So I don't know, I don't know. I mean, after 9-11, I would have signed up to, to do anything. But it's a great question. I wish I had a better answer. Thank you again for your pending service. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much, I appreciate it.